Hello and welcome to the John Ark Show. Today's episode is called, Is Panama a Good Place to Relocate To? We're going to answer some viewer questions. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to subscribe, like, uh, follow, and comment on the show. Um, I'd also like to tell you about a company called HollywoodIsCalling.com. It allows people to purchase a live call uh, for $19.95. That's a 15-second call, or you can purchase a 30-second call for $29.95. So give it a try. It's called HollywoodIsCalling.com. Now let's get started. First question is from Lucy, and she writes, Is Panama really a good place to relocate to for financial reasons? How safe is it to live there? Well, the cost of living in Panama is considerably lower than the cost of living in places like New York or California. But you have to remember the quality of life is also much lower. Uh, you have to get used to frequent power outages and loss of internet service for hours or days at a time. You also have to, you also have to get used to an economy and a job market that is much smaller and has fewer opportunities than the U.S. market. On the plus side of the equation, the cost of health care is much more affordable and the people there are really nice. I'm also seeing a lot of people who relocated down there and uh, it turns out they can actually afford to live right on the ocean which is something they could never do in the United States because of the high prices. Um, if you want to move there and you want to start a business of some sort um, then that could dramatically increase your chances of succeeding. Uh, if you're just uh, going down there to live off your pension then that's certainly possible but you have to live uh, very carefully within your budget. Uh, one thing a lot of expats say is that you should live there for a year before you buy a home and, and I'm a firm believer in that as well. You know, the reason for that is sometimes the culture shock of living there is so dramatic that a lot of people decide they want to leave after 6 to 12 months. And you don't want to be settled with, a, you know, with the need to sell a house at that point. You want to be able to just leave. So rent before you buy in Panama. Next, we have a, a question from Larry who writes, How realistic and possible is it to sell your house and live a nomadic life out of a motorhome? Um, he says, Is that a good way to save money or will it be just exchanging one set of problems for another? Well, if you go on YouTube, you'll find countless people who try to live out their lives in their motorhomes or their trailers. You know, the people I've spoken to say selling your house is a bad idea. What seems to work uh, better for them is to travel two, three, or four months of the year and spend the rest of your time uh, living in your home. You know, part of the uh, part of the equation is determined by where you live. If you live in a high tax state uh, where housing prices are are going through the roof, uh, then you may find that once you sell your house, you'll never be able to afford another one because the prices have gone up so much. You could be you could be a permanently trapped renter. And you don't want to become a long-term renter because only a, it's only a matter of time before you get priced completely out of the rental market and can't even afford an apartment anymore. You know, I've heard uh, that of all the homeless people living on the streets of Los Angeles now, more than 50,000 of them have become homeless recently because they couldn't afford the latest rent increase. That's an unbelievable statistic. These people aren't homeless because of drugs or alcohol or mental illness. They became homeless because they simply couldn't afford their landlord's latest rent increase. That to me is stunning. You know, another problem with living a nomadic lifestyle out of a trailer or motorhome is that you know it also involves costs all its own. You have fuel, maintenance, insurance, park fees, rental fees, food, utilities, and, and you know, uh, all these things, they still have to be paid. Um, so, you know, you have to weigh these things very carefully before you do something as dramatic as selling your house and live, living out of an RV. Next question is from Bradley. Bradley writes, is it still possible to make money in the legal marijuana business, given what's been happening lately? Well, I'm hearing that the legal marijuana stores in Los Angeles are basically empty and that many other stores in other cities are struggling because people just don't have the money for legal drugs. Uh, some of the customers are buying their marijuana from illegal dealers so they can get cheaper prices, but that's always tricky because it's not regulated. You don't know what you're getting, and you could always end up getting arrested, which involves even more legal costs. 
The other issue that uh, now that nobody wants to talk about because it's not politically correct is that, you know, but it's something that everybody is thinking about, and that is if smoking is bad for your lungs, and all of the recent uh, issues have been lung related, then how smart is it to keep smoking? Won't that make your lungs weaker and more susceptible to recent issues? I suspect uh, that on some level, without publicly admitting it or discussing it, a lot of people are smoking less because they are worried about weakening their lungs and becoming more susceptible to, to, the, uh, to the issues out there, to the current health crisis. Uh, the other unresolved problem with the marijuana business is that on a federal level, it is still illegal. You know, and that creates a lot of issues in and of itself. Regardless of what your state laws are, if the feds want to, they can come in and target your business and shut you down when you least expect it. Now, I suspect that a lot of companies and individuals who were strongly considering getting into the business six months ago, a lot of them have not put those plans on hold just to see what direction everything goes in, um, especially the election in November. You know, on a side note, it appears that alcohol sales have skyrocketed, you know, as a lot of people sit home and drink each night. You know, if you're in the alcohol business or the business of selling alcohol, not nightclubs or bars, because those, those people are still struggling. But I mean, if you, if you sell alcohol at the retail level, uh, then you're probably doing pretty well. Next, we have a question from Alan. Alan writes, what's the best and least expensive way to fix a car problem? Very common question we get. The first thing you should do is go on to Google and, and check the symptoms to see if anybody else out there has had a similar problem. You should also go on YouTube and, and watch some videos posted by people who've also had the same problem that you have with the same make and model car. Uh, see if those can help you fix your own problem. If it's simple enough, you'd be surprised at how often you can fix it, even if you know very little about cars. Those uh, YouTube instructional videos are amazingly helpful. But if none of that works, then you should ask friends or family for, for good recommendations on a mechanic. If that's not possible, then go on Yelp and find some really highly rated local mechanics with, with great feedback. Call six or seven of them and get their opinion on the phone and then pick one that you think is most com competent and trustworthy. The next question is from Trinity. Trinity writes, is organic food really worth all the extra cost of buying it? Well, some stores like Walmart are increasing the size of their organic grocery departments and they're trying to drive down the price of organic foods. You know, at the end of the day, you know, everybody has to live within their budget. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, uh, that most organic food is better and healthier for you, but only if you uh, if you can decide that your budget can handle those high prices. You know, I think that generally speaking, it's best to avoid processed foods and packaged foods, and just stick with meat, fruits, and vegetables. I tend to avoid things that are sold in a can, a box, or a bag. I try to stick with natural foods, so that's something you might want to think about. Next, Cone writes, uh, my accounting and bookkeeping business has taken a real hit this year. What should I do? Small accounting and bookkeeping businesses are being challenged by a number of issues. The first is the growing sophistication of all the accounting software packages out there uh, that are now available for small businesses. Uh, as more of this technology gets enhanced with artificial intelligence, then its popularity will continue to grow. The next issue is that the government is constantly re, uh, reducing the regulations and simplifying the tax code, which means that business owners will need less accounting advice uh, in the coming years. Next, we have a question from Connor. Connor writes, I'm thinking of opening up a large outdoor flea market. I've seen them work in other areas. Does this sound like a viable business to you? I think that depends on the land costs and all your other overhead. Remember, even if you open it up tomorrow, it can take years for a business like that to generate enough vendors, customers, and revenue to turn a profit. I've seen you know, indoor flea markets work in some depressed areas, but generally speaking, the cost of real estate is very difficult for them. Outdoor flea markets can work, but there is even, but there is even growing competition in that space, uh, and that's driving down their profit margins. Uh, next question is from David. David writes, I'm thinking of starting a private security firm to protect stores and private property. What do you think? Well, I'm amazed at how many retailers still refuse uh, to increase their, their security in light of recent events. 
you know, there are blocks and blocks and blocks in Manhattan, Beverly Hills, Los Angeles, and Santa Monica, where all the famous and high-end stores have been smashed out, burned out, or boarded up because of recent events. It seems to me that these retailers should all be bringing in private security, but most of them aren't. You know, the one enormous problem with, with uh, uh, the security business is the issue of liability. It's a very risky business, and when things go wrong, you could get hit with so many lawsuits that exceed the coverage of your insurance company that, uh, that you end up not being covered, and that could bankrupt you. So with that, I want to thank you for watching, and we will talk to you soon.